Have you ever been bitten by a mosquito? Well, yes, I have been too. Almost everyone around the world has had this experience at least once in their lives. But tell me, have you ever wondered why it's itchy right afterwards? And the answer might surprise you. It's actually saliva. It turns out that just like you and me, insects like mosquitoes have saliva that they use when they eat. They inject it into our skin, where it numbs the bite so we don't feel the pain, and they, it makes the blood flow freely so they can take the biggest meal that they can before flying away. Unless this happens. But the itch that you feel is actually our immune system responding to the different molecules in the saliva. And there are many molecules in the saliva, all of which can be classified as proteins, sugars, lipids, and other types of components. Now, a lot of research until now has focused specifically on the proteins, and not a lot of attention has been paid to the sugars. And that is why I was interested in looking at them. Now, I'm going to look at the sugars in the saliva, not only of mosquitoes, but of all of these blood feeders, tsetse flies, ticks, sand flies, and kissing bugs. But why do we care about saliva? Now, the most important reason is that they can all transmit disease. Diseases that can be well known like malaria, dengue, or sleeping sickness. Because saliva is such an important part of the biting process, it can influence how our bodies respond to these invaders and can have an effect on the success or not of an infection in our bodies. The other reason that we can care about saliva is because of the allergic responses that they can induce in some people. And here, I want to tell you a bit more about ticks. But let me first start with a story and a question. What is your favorite food in the whole wide world? For many people, it could be this juicy, delicious, 100% beef burger. Now imagine taking a bite of this burger and savoring all those delicious flavors, finishing your meal and going to bed quite happy. And then waking up in the middle of the night feeling not so good. Your body is full of rashes that really itch, your throat starts to close and your blood pressure drops. You could be experiencing a red meat allergy. And surprisingly enough, the culprit could actually be a tick. Ticks feed differently to mosquitoes and other blood feeders. They attach themselves to your skin, where they remain for several days. And during all of this time, they're constantly injecting you with saliva and other molecules. Now, for many people, the bites go completely unnoticed. But for others, it can have life-changing consequences, like the development of an allergy to red meat. The first cases of red meat allergy were reported in Australia around the 1980s. But even many years after, doctors remained puzzled as to why so many people were developing this severe allergic response to red meat. And after a lot of research, they found that what these patients had in common was that they all remembered being bitten by ticks. When they looked at their blood tests, they showed abnormally high levels of an antibody called IgE, which is involved in allergic responses. And in this case, that IgE was specific for a sugar called alpha-gal. And this was the first suggestion that there was a link between this alpha-gal, the tick bites, and the allergy to red meat. But this story of discovery doesn't end there. In the US, some patients were reporting really severe allergic reactions to a cancer drug called cetuximab. When they looked at the blood of these patients, they also saw abnormally high levels of this IgE antibodies against the alpha-gal sugar. Now, humans don't produce the alpha-gal sugar, and that's why our bodies recognize it as foreign and produce antibodies against it. It turns out that the cetuximab drug is produced in a mouse cell line. And because mice do produce the alpha-gal sugar, the drug ended up being decorated with all of these molecules. And when it was given to some patients, they developed a severe reaction against it. But why only some patients? 
Well, a bit more digging found out that the patients that developed the severe reaction lived in rural areas of southeast U.S., rural areas where they could be more exposed to the bites of ticks. And so all of this evidence started coming together to suggest and reinforce that strong link between tick bites and the development of red meat allergy. As the condition became more well-known, this alpha-gal syndrome, doctors started to register it in different parts of the world. And in each region, it could be associated to a different species of tick. Now we know that thousands or perhaps more around the world have developed this alpha-gal syndrome and cannot eat meat anymore. But it's not only beef. They can be allergic to pork, to milk, to the gelatin capsules that surround some medications, and even, in some unfortunate cases, to life-saving drugs like cetuximab. Now, there's, there continues to be a lot of debate about the source of this alpha-gal, but some researchers believe that it is found in the saliva of the tick. And this is why these researchers in Brazil decided to explore this connection between the tick bite and the red meat allergy for the Brazilian tick, Amblyoma sculptum in particular, which is the most commonly distributed in Brazil. So in order to do this in the lab, they needed to create a model to be able to study the, effect, the effects of tick saliva. Because humans don't produce alpha-gal, they created a mouse model that also doesn't produce the alpha-gal sugar. They then exposed these mice to tick bites or to the saliva of, obtained from these ticks. And when they looked at the blood of the mice, they saw that they produced antibodies against the alpha-gal sugar. And this was very nice evidence that the origin of the sugar was actually the saliva of the ticks. And at this point, we started a collaboration where my job was to find the sugars in the, in the saliva of the ticks and confirm that the alpha-gal was actually there. And first, I want to tell you a little bit about the sugars here. Now, sugars can be also known as glycans, and they are found in all living systems, inside and outside the cells. They can have roles in aspects like metabolism, structure, or cell-cell interactions. And here we see a classic image of the surface of a red blood cell, where all of this fuzz on the surface are actually glycans. They're attached to lipids or proteins. And these glycans are the ones that determine your blood group. So they are actually very well known. When sugars are attached to proteins, they form glycoproteins. And these are just some types of the structures that you can find attached to proteins. And this attachment can actually influence the protein's folding, interaction, and immunogenicity. And by immunogenicity, I mean the type of strong or weak immune responses that this combination can generate in our bodies. And so the way that I go about studying the sugars in the saliva of the blood feeders is first by extracting their saliva. And so I, can di I have to dissect hundreds of these insects at a time. As you can see here, the salivary glands have been extracted from each of them. I take that saliva into the lab to process, where I treat it with an enzyme that allows me to separate the sugar from the protein to study each one individually. Now, for purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on the sugars because that's what we're interested in right now. I label the sugars with a fluorescent marker that allows me to detect them more easily by liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry. Now, this is the type of result that I would get after that analysis, using ticks as an example. And in this chromatogram, you can see the profile of salivary sugars, where each of the peaks corresponds to a different structure that we now know. But this gives me a very general idea. And after further analysis and treatment, for example, with specific enzymes, I can rebuild, rebuild each of these structures. And here I am showing you the, that we found the sugar structure that contains this alpha-gal, which is this portion that we find here. 
And so it's a confirmation that the alpha-gal sugar is actually present in the saliva of ticks. But now that we know that the sugar structure is there, what is the protein that this alpha-gal is actually attached to? So here I turn to the proteins in the saliva. And for example, each of these bands are, is representing a different protein in the saliva of ticks. And then I then purify one of these proteins that has the alpha-gal using a marker that is specific for this sugar, as you can see here that is labeled with the asterisk. I then take this protein and identify it by mass spectrometry and get a list of candidates. These results together help me to confirm that the alpha-gal is actually present in the saliva of ticks, that it forms part of a glycoprotein, and that knowing, the, and knowing this structure can actually help me use these molecules as tools to improve diagnosis or even perhaps to create better treatments for the people that are affected by this condition, the alpha-gal syndrome. But the tick story is only a part of a much larger project where I'm characterizing the salivary sugars of all of these blood feeders. And because we know how important sugars can be to the type of immune responses that saliva can trigger in our bodies, this information will allow me to potentially use each of these structures as a tool to diagnose, monitor, or better treat diseases in different ways. And so the next time you're bitten by a mosquito, you and I will know what's going on there in that little bit of skin. All the complex reactions that are being started, you now know that saliva has proteins and sugars. And you know that somewhere around the world, there is one scientist looking at how all of this happens.